Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. So welcome to this uh, panel four of our conference. We've been having um, a lovely time throughout the day here in Hong Kong from the morning time. We've had keynote speeches. This is a panel called Death and Survival, Cultures of Governance. We're very pleased to have four extinct, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, I will just introduce the convener uh, of this uh, panel. First of all, I'm John Ernie. I'm the co-organizer of this conference. So Professor Daniel Weinstock, who is our convener at this panel, uh, will be um, hosting this um, with three other uh, esteemed speakers uh, from Canada, uh, from the US and also uh, Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Daniel Weinstock is the, is the Catherine A. Pearson Chair in the Faculty of Law and the Department of Philosophy at McGill University. Before coming to McGill, he was teaching at the University of Montreal. And before that, he studied in various places, uh, including Oxford, Harvard, and Columbia. And before he joined the faculty of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Montreal. In 2013, and from 2013 to 2019, he also held a James McGill professorship at McGill, uh, where he stays. He was the director of McGill's Institute for Health and Social Policy from 2013 to this year. Uh, as I said, you know, before he joined McGill, he taught philosophy at the University of Montreal, where he held both tier one and tier two Canada research chairs. Uh, at the University of Montreal, he was also the founding director of the Center for Research on Ethics. So uh, welcome everyone, and um, I'll pass at this time uh, to Professor Weinstein. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Professor Ernie. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be part of this, uh, of this event. It would be uh, wonderful to be with you all uh, in Hong Kong, but uh, I guess we'll have to wait uh, for a further uh, opportunity to, uh, to do that. So as Professor Ernie said, my name is Daniel Weinstock and I'll be uh, organizing things uh, for, for the panel. My first uh, order of business is first of all to apologize for the background noise, which you're probably all hearing, which is due to the fact that uh, I'm doing this as many of us are from home and uh, there's construction right next door. So you will be having the joy of hearing uh, uh, drills and things uh, throughout uh, my part of the exchange. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I'm going to introduce um, uh, all, of, uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker uh, before he speaks rather than doing them all uh, seriatim so that you have a, a memory of who you're listening to uh, uh, right at the moment that they're speaking. So I'd like to begin, um, well, I'd like to begin by saying something general uh, about the panel. I think that the, the papers are uh, going to be quite diverse and I think that our challenge is going to be um, to show how in very uh, different ways they all speak to the general theme of the governance of um, the uh, response to COVID-19, which in different ways and the different societies that we come from, we are all uh, undergoing. So I'm going to do my best during the discussion period to bring out some themes of common uh, interest around uh, the issue of, uh, of governance. Our first speaker is Professor Jamer Hunt. Um, Professor Hunt collaboratively designs open and adaptable frameworks for participation that respond to emergent cultural conditions in education, organizations, exhibitions, and for the public. He's the Vice Provost for Transdisciplinary Initiatives at the New School, uh, where he has been since 2016, and where he was the founding director of the Graduate Program in Transdisciplinary Design at the Parsons School of Design. Uh, he was also, rather, the founding director of the Graduate Program in Transdisciplinary Design at the Parsons School of Design from 2009 to 2015. He's also a visiting design researcher at the Institute of Design in Umea, Sweden. And he's the author of Not to Scale, how the small becomes large, the large becomes unthinkable, and the unthinkable becomes possible, a title that seems very appropriate to what we are uh, undergoing right now, a book that repositions scale as a practice-based framework for analyzing complex systems. Fast Company has named him to their list of their most creative people. With Paola Antonelli at the MoMA, he was co-creator of the award-winning cur curatorial experiment and book, Design and Violence, and he's published over 20 articles on the poetics and politics of design, including for Fast Company and the Huffington Post. He's the co-author also with Meredith Davis of Visual Communication Design, 2017. Professor Hunt, the virtual floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, um, Professor Weinstock. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, such an honor to be here. It's, such, it's so exciting to be amongst an international group uh, and yet um, so sad that we can't be there together, as you mentioned. So um, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you especially uh, to John and Meta for organizing this event. And I hope wherever you are in the world, whatever time of day it is, that you're safe and that you're well. Um, and I just want to start with a brief land acknowledgement um, by acknowledging that I am in Lenapahoking, the ancestral seized and occupied territory of the Lenape people here in the United States. Um, what I'd like to do now is just take a moment to share my screen. I'm going to not forget to click the button to share my sound. And if all goes well, you will be seeing the title of my talk, A Virus at Scale. Um, so I think I'm probably going to come at this from a very different angle um, than uh, most people uh, have addressed so far during this um, symposium and conference. But I will. Um, uh, I think that the issues that I bring up will actually resonate around questions of governance. Uh, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, Professor Weinstock synthesizing all of these and bringing them together somehow. Um, so my work, as described, really addresses questions of uh, design and complex systems, um, and in particular is oriented around the question of scale, as I will describe in just one minute. So let's dive into this. 190,000, 2 trillion, 450 billion, 917,000, 6 million, 400,000, 28 million, 600,000, 9 trillion. So these are numbers that have come at us from all angles uh, throughout these months of the pandemic, um, challenging us to come to grips with a pandemic, the scale of which we're, we only rudimentarily understand and have a very hard time processing. And then for me, it's that sort of uh, challenge of how we process a global pandemic at scale that's really at the heart of the presentation I want to give today, um, and in particular, how we uh, navigate and negotiate the information, the knowledge, and the actions that we need to take under those circumstances. Um, you know, the New York Times, uh, for instance, uh, in May, um, produced this front page of their newspaper, which was an attempt to grasp and grapple with uh, the looming uh, number of 100,000 deaths within the United States. Um, and it was attempted to, to look at both the, the small and the large. And so graphically, uh, the front page tries to capture the sense of the vastness of the impact that this has, something that's so hard for us as individuals to grasp, and yet also focuses on individual names. It's not 100,000 names, it's actually um, uh, fewer than that, but each name is followed by a, a brief excerpt from the person's obituary uh, to give some character to that individual. And so what we see here is this tension between, you know, sort of the granular and the global, the, the micro and the macro, the individual and the, and the mass. And it's really in that um, uh, dialectic, in that tension, um, that I want to situate this presentation. Um, and in particular, I will probably do so um, reflecting mostly from the context of the United States. Um, uh, and I'm not out of a sense of exceptionalism, certainly in this moment, as uh, Professor Slack pointed out earlier, um, and others did as well. Um, it's not a moment of exceptionalism, in fact, just the opposite. Um, so what I want to do today um, is to look at the coronavirus and the pandemic through the lens of scale. What do we learn when we think through scale? And, you know, for many of you, scale may not be a construct or a framework that you think through much. Um, for many people, it's simply a way of measuring things, of comparing uh, the diff relative sizes of things. But I think we can do more with it. Um, and in particular, what I want to argue is we are going through a moment, um, a kind of almost paradigm shift where we are no longer uh, comfortable with or able to navigate scale in the same kind of way. And it's primarily due to two things. First is the dematerialization of the information economy. Um, that is that physical things have become immaterial to us, things we can no longer touch. They've been decoupled from the human body and the human sensorium. And the other is the entanglement uh, of the networks that are interconnected that bring us all together instantaneously 
globally. And that these two things together are shifting our capacity to comprehend the world, um, to act in the world, and they're upsetting cause and effect relationships that we've come to understand. And one of the things that's um, uh, characteristic of this moment, I think, as well, is this idea that as problems shift in scale, they shift in quality as well. And that's something we're struggling um, to capture and struggling to work through. So my goal here is to help all of us think through scale as a way to understand the present. So to do that, I want to go through a few uh, simple examples uh, just to illustrate what I mean by this kind of sense of not being to scale, and then to relate that to the coronavirus and uh, to the pandemic. Um, so recently I did a scan of my hard drive and I discovered I have over 1.7 million files on my laptop. I'm not that prolific. Um, I have no idea what these files are. I live within this world now, this kind of virtual world where the numbers and the scale are just overwhelming to me. But at the same time, my laptop keeps shrinking. Each time I get a new laptop, it gets smaller and yet what it can hold gets larger. So there's this kind of uh, physical uh, incommensurability going on uh, that I struggle with. But more importantly to this is that it's not just that I have 1.7 million files, most of which I don't understand on my laptop. It's that my laptop also contains my life right now. It contains all of the work I've done for the last 15 years, all of the correspondence I've done for the last 15 or 20 years, um, photos of my children, videos of my children, mortgage applications, my mother's eulogy, um, you know, every single item of importance now sits within this thing that I cannot touch, I cannot smell, I cannot grasp, I can't get in there. And it leads me to ask this question, how much does a gigabyte weigh? What is this phenomenological material world that we're now inhabiting and how does it relate to the human senses and to uh, our uh, corporeality, to our bodily um, capacity to process what's going on? 675,186. This was an estimate by the New York Times. This is about five years ago, things have increased. Um, of the number of cyber attacks going on globally per month, um, and what this points to, to me, is this kind of invisible surround of a kind of crime slash warfare um, that we are incapable of perceiving, yet surrounds us at every moment. And it's not simply that uh, we're being attacked at the level of the nation or at the corporation, but it's every individual as well is vulnerable to this. Um, and so there is this uh, kind of incommensurability, again, with our kind of human capacity to understand conflict and then this conflict that surrounds us all the time. And Google actually launched a few years back the digital attack map to give some sense of what's going on in the world in terms of cyber attacks to visualize that for us because it's sort of beyond our own capacity to, to follow. And this just simply points out kind of where attacks are coming from in real time, where they're headed for. Uh, it gives some way for us to kind of process this surround of, um, global conflict uh, and of global risk and vulnerability. Um, something that again is inaccessible to us, despite the fact that it's constant total uh, and increasing, e especially during the coronavirus pandemic, what we've seen is actually increases in the numbers of cyber attacks, in part because so many of us are now online, it gives more targets. Um, and finally, uh, well, before I get to that, just one uh, fact from this security, uh, industry, 85% of people posting puppy photos are trying to scam you. So just a public service announcement from me to you. Um, finally, this is a slide um, that was presented at a morning briefing to General Stanley McChrystal um, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Um, and this was shortly uh, after the counterinsurgency effort from the US and NATO forces into Afghanistan. Um, and he walked into the briefing that morning and he was presented with PowerPoint slides as he normally is. And at one point he came to this particular slide and he famously quipped, when we understand this slide, we'll have won the war. Um, now, for me, you know, you could just put, say this is just a, a nice little quip, a joke. Um, but I think it points to, again, this kind of struggle with scale, that the amount of information that we have um, has really reached a point where sort of our maps are exceeding the territory. 
And this is a reference in some ways to the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges' story on exactitude in science, um, where uh, the map makers make a map that's so large that it becomes the size of the territory itself, and, then, and thus becomes, in a sense, kind of useless, um, that a quantitative change becomes a qualitative change as things increase in scale. And so here what's happening is the amount of information is so vast that it's shifted the idea of warfare from boots on the ground, power, might, physicality, tanks, bullets, knives, et cetera, to logistics, information, coordination, um, risk management. Uh, and so we've seen this kind of qualitative change as the amount of information is so great that it shifts qualitatively from signal to noise uh, and no longer do we understand warfare in terms of a kind of physical interaction, but it becomes instead um, a it shifts qualitatively to a logistical risk management information. So then how do we kind of understand um, the coronavirus thinking through scale? Um, how can we begin to see uh, uh, what's going on and understand it perhaps a little bit differently? Um, and the first thing I want to point out, too, I want to point to sort of three particular vectors, let's say. Uh, the first is invisibility, um, but you might also think about it as imageability. Uh, and uh, at least in the United States, in the early days of the coronavirus, um, what you saw was that the incapacity, because the virus itself is microscopic in size, we have to image it some way. We have to image the threat some way, and that threat was imaged indexically, as some mutations would say, through the idea of the mask. And at this point in, in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control were saying to us, don't wear masks. Um, don't wear masks because the frontline workers need the masks and we're not convinced that the masks do any good. Um, and so we were all told not to wear masks. And yet the way in which the virus was imaged was primarily through uh, people on the streets wearing masks. You see these photos over and over and over again um, as a way to kind of image this threat that otherwise is invisible to us. Um, then what you begin to saw is images of the virus itself. This is a, uh, a rendering of the virus um, in a sense to give a kind of face to the enemy, um, to give us something to hold on to, something for us to process in terms of uh, figuring out who that enemy is because that enemy is so small, so microscopic that we without you know the technology can't see this enemy where it is and where it may threaten us. And it got to this remarkable point, I'm sure many of us can re remember these moments where you know, you'd go to the grocery store and come back with your groceries and then have to figure out how to take your groceries out of the bag and put them away without creating more contact and more virus spread and it, kind of everything around us suddenly was charged with a sense of threat. I'll never forget a moment where I took the groceries home, took them out of the bags, took my can of Lysol disinfectant spray, started spraying the boxes of groceries and things like that. Uh, and then um, I thought for a moment, I thought, uh oh, my hands are potentially infected and I've touched the Lysol spray. Do I need to spray the canister of Lysol with a canister of Lysol to disinfect the canister of Lysol? So you get to these kind of uh, ridiculous moments where um, the threat is pervasive, it's everywhere, it's total, it's both invisible and total. And that's where thinking through scale will hopefully help us to kind of process this a bit. But part of this moment is also a, a, a kind of uh, compounding formula, that it's not just invisibility, but it's invisibility times misinformation. Um, many of you may have seen these images of cell phone towers being burned, particularly started out in the United Kingdom, but spread to other parts of the world. Um, and this was, you know, this was a common uh, kind of uh, target of attack by people who uh, felt as though these 5G cell phone towers were um, either creating uh, the virus, creating the symptoms, uh, making us weaker so that the virus was stronger, any number of, of sort of theories of how this um, uh, coronavirus was spreading. But people were lighting cell phone towers on fire because they felt that they were spreading the disease themselves. Um, and this becomes part of what I sort of refer to as the deep fake, deep state axis. Um, the sort of distrust everyone, distrust everything you know. When information becomes so easily manipulated, um, when it becomes spread so quickly that we, we lose the kind of legitimating infrastructure of knowledge, trust, science, et cetera, because so much is coming at us 
so quickly. Um, and uh, Dr. Harry Wu last night talked about anti-vaxxers as well, uh, or last night for me, sorry. Um, I don't know when it was. Uh, but uh, as another group that was sort of struggling, um, because there is so much convincing information uh, that comes at you so quickly and that we've lost that capacity to sort of legitimate uh, knowledge in any particular way. And if you think that this is just the lunatic fringe, these are just the people um, you know, who don't know better, that aren't as smart as all of us, um, I just want to give you a counterexample. So early in March, again, as, uh, as I was still in my office in New York, um, my sister sent me an email on March 10th as the coronavirus was starting to appear in the United States. Um, and what uh, what this virus, uh, excuse me, what this email suggested was that it was from the state, as you see in the subject line, it was from the Stanford Medical uh, Group and um, from a member of the Stanford Hospital Board, which sounds eminently uh, reasonable. And um, so what they were saying, what this email was saying, and I have to, um, I'm struggling here because uh, one of my windows is blocking part of what I'm supposed to read. Um, serious, excellent advice by Japanese doctors treating COVID-19 cases. Everyone should ensure your mouth and throat are moist. Um, why? Even if the virus gets into your mouth, drinking water and other liquid, liquids will wash them down through your throat. And the stomach acid will kill the virus if you don't drink enough water more regularly. The virus can enter your wind, windpipe and into the lungs and so on. So this came to me from my sister, who is a uh, certified financial planner, very well educated. Um, she was worried about her family, worried about her siblings, worried about her friends. So she was sharing this email broadly. Um, I read this and I thought, wow, this is great. It's really sensible advice. You know, it, it makes this all seem a little bit easier. It's very comforting. Um, fortunately, I live with a doctor. Uh, and so I took this to my wife and said, uh, this seems a little strange to me. Uh, can you verify that this is, in fact, um, legitimate information. And she said, no, nah, this doesn't quite smell right. Um, so I looked it up, and of course, this was a hoax. Um, but uh, it just goes to show that, uh, so then that morning, I was uh, in a uh, uh, university academic leadership meeting with our provost and deputy provost and, and executive deans. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I suggested that we as a university should just be careful uh, to let our students know that there's lots of uh, bad information going around um, and that you, um, you know, we've got to protect them, let them know. Um, and at that point, uh, the deputy provost and one of the executive deans uh, raised their hand and said, well, I've been drinking water every 15 minutes uh, all morning um, because I read this same email. Um, and so it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how well educated you are, we are all susceptible to this kind of wild disinformation that's moving at a speed that we can scarcely uh, understand. Um, let's see. And so finally, in this formula, we have invisibility times misinformation times math. And to understand the math, I'm going to try and um, warp uh, time and space and jump now to a brief video. Um, this is from, uh, uh, from the 1980s. It's a shampoo commercial, but I hope you'll bear with me because it has some interesting ways of thinking about, well, let me jump back here for a moment, what I call the two friends problem. Um, so hopefully you will be able to hear. When I first tried Fabergé Organic Shampoo with pure wheat germ oil and honey, it was so good I told two friends about it, and they told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. And believe me, there's still nothing like the original Fabergé Organic. It gives me super shine, super body, and super fresh smelling hair. Try it, and you'll tell your friends about it, and they'll tell their friends, and so on, and so on. Be sure and get the original Fabergé organic shampoo and conditioner with pure wheat germ oil and honey. Okay, so this is an excellent example of the math of how a pandemic spreads. Um, and yet one of the things you'll notice in this video is that there are actually two different mathematical models that are present here. Um, so the virus spreads by telling a, two friends and they tell two friends and so on and so on. And so if you look at the math here, you go from one person uh, let me go back. You go from one person to two people to four people to nine people to uh, 16. Um, strangely enough, at the end of the ad, um, you go from one person uh, to two people to four people to uh, 16. Um, so, so what? Uh, this seems insignificant in all of this. Um, but in fact, what it gets at is really the complexity of the math 
It sits behind the ways in which we actually try and combat the virus. Um, that is to say, it's two different mathematical formulae uh, that are being presented here, two different mathematical sequences. Um, in the first case, you have um, the sequence of one, two, uh, excuse me, one, four, nine, I know it goes right, 16. Um, uh, that is a particular sequence that if you thought about 10 kind of contacts would take you um, to just over 100 potential incidences of the virus spreading. Um, in the second instance, you have instead this geometric sequence of uh, two to zero power, then, then uh, two to the first, then you get four, then you get uh, eight, then 16. Um, this is actually how the virus spreads. Um, and this is the mathematics behind it. To understand this, what we needed to understand, and I'll wrap up in just one moment, what we needed to understand in this was uh, not the epidemiology behind, behind how this spread. That was one part of the story, but we needed to understand the math. And that math is very difficult to grasp, very um, uh, insensible, um, you know, sort of requires a level of education that surpasses many of us, certainly the ad writers and the uh, shampoo ad didn't quite get it right either. Um, you need to know things such as, um, mortality rates, the serial interval, what are not means, et cetera. Um, so you get this kind of compounding formula of invisibility times misinformation times math. Um, another way of thinking about it is the infinitesimal times the immaterial times the insensible, um, that these compounding factors at scale create a kind of pandemic um, that we're having a very difficult time managing, not just because of the epidemiological consequences, but because of the sort of surround of an ecosystem uh, that is no longer at scale to us. So the paradox is at this moment when um, we feel all powerful because we have all this information, we also feel remarkably powerless. And that solving this equation is going to be our way through this. And to do that, we're going to have to think at scale. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I will now stop sharing my screen. Um, and thanks so much. I look forward to the discussion. Sorry. You'd think that after six months of living on Zoom, uh, the reflex of unmuting oneself would have become second nature, but obviously it is not. Sorry about that. Uh, so thank you very much, Jamer. Um, we're going to move right on to the next presentation uh, by uh, Professor David Lyon. Uh, David Lyon is the director of the Surveillance Studies Center at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He was educated at the University of Bradford in the UK, and he's been studying surveillance since the mid-1980s. Uh, he's a pioneer in the field of surveillance studies, and he's produced a steady stream of books translated into 18 languages and articles. Uh, the books start with The Electronic Eye in 1994, and the latest is The Culture of Surveillance, 2018. And he's completing Surveillance, A Very Short Introduction. Um, he's led several large collaborative research projects on surveillance with research funding totaling almost $8 million. His work has been recognized in Canada, Switzerland, the USA, and the UK, uh, with a number of fellowships, prizes, awards, and an honorary uh, doctorate. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. And um, I want to thank the uh, organizers as well, for John and Meta in particular. And uh, I too want to uh, note that uh, we, uh, my home and the university in which I teach is on the traditional land of Anishinaabe and uh, Haudenosaunee people. And uh, in this context, the colonialism that produced that continues to affect what I'm talking about today, which is uh, surveillance during a pandemic. So the appearance of COVID-19 as a global pandemic has stimulated massive local, national, and international attempts to find ways to mitigate its impact, while e the equally urgent task of finding suitable vaccines is underway. And prominent within such initiatives is an array of surveillance devices and systems, which by June 2020 had appeared in nearly 40 countries around the world. Infected Hong Kong residents are required to use wearable devices to ensure that they uh, are observing quarantine rules. Indians wearing wristbands are alerted by a geofence that uh, if they enter some risky area, such as uh, public transit. 
new arrivals in Thailand uh, are obliged to insert SIM cards into their phones that track their movement using GPS. On the Paris uh, Metro, uh, facial recognition technologies are used to check that riders are masked. And from early on, drones were used in China to check on citizen movements and equipped with speakers to tell people to return home. Uh, in China, they also use drones for remote temperature checking in apartment buildings. But probably the best known devices and uh, systems are those that are used to aid in the vital task of contact tracing. In June, the Canadian government uh, announced that it was supporting smartphone, a smartphone app to alert those who've been near someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. Of course, these things have become commonplace in many countries. Uh, the one in Canada, developed by a group with uh, an Ottawa-based Spotify company, uh, is called COVID Alert, and it relies on an interface, an API, uh, that's provided by the joint efforts of Apple and Google. And its use is voluntary, its usefulness depends in part on the uptake rate, and it remains blind to unreported cases, which in some areas is significant. It's approved by the Federal Privacy Commissioner in Canada and by leading critics. And the app doesn't collect personal information or location data. It just uses Bluetooth to identify other devices coming within two meters for 15 minutes or more of the person using it. And one could go on talking about the, uh, that particular device. It's probably uh, less subject to criticism than uh, some in other countries. But uh, in some countries where there is less care about the actual systems, um, you, you, you find quite, some quite different results. At MIT, there is a COVID tracing tracker which captures details of every significant contact tracing system in the world, scoring each for its concern with civil liberties. Democracies, as you might expect, use more safeguards than other polities, such as China's, which using an Alibaba subsidiary, assigns a color code to each user's address, lifestyle, self-reported symptoms, and uh, shares these with police. The one thing the MIT tracker doesn't show is whether or not democracies do less surveillance than others. So while contact tracing devices, along with drones, facial recognition and wearables have sparked most critical concerns, other systems are less obvious, especially those involving data analytics. Health data information systems are also viewed uh, as key components of the drive to understand trends. And of course, this is not dissimilar from some of the points that Jamer was just making, that uh, some of the most significant systems that we use are the ones that are most uh, invisible to us, opaque in their uh, usage, and so on. Data are sought across platforms and databases as a means of tracking the course of the virus and of ensuring that, for instance, hardest hit areas uh, are adequately served with testing and treatment uh, for COVID-19, at least uh, that's the hope. Some governments use anonymized customer data from corporations. Sometimes police have access to information uh, about active COVID cases. Uh, I, I have friends who recently visited another Canadian province, uh, Nova Scotia, to uh, see relatives and uh, they were told that to ensure compliance with COVID restrictions, the, uh, they would have daily calls from the uh, federal police here in Canada, the RCMP, while they were in quarantine. And, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Understandably, the pandemic emergency catalyzes efforts to find out exactly what is happening, to understand what's happening and to plan responses in prompt and responsible ways. Lives, after all, are at stake. But the difficulty here is that health is not the only component of human well-being. Who has access to, access to sensitive data 
the character and trustworthiness of the algorithms used to analyze those data and reliance on machine learning and uh, AI are also vital questions because the life chances and choices, the rights and the opportunities of millions of citizens are also at stake when their data are analyzed and processed within such systems. From early on in the pandemic, Many civil liberties uh, organizations around the world, including Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International and so on, made a joint statement warning of the dangers of systems and devices mobilized against the pandemic. Well, for me to say this as an academic who has spent many years trying to understand the changing character of surveillance now in a digital world is all very well. But the problem is that we academics don't necessarily communicate that well with either specialists or the citizens in the situations that we're trying to understand. Our research at the Surveillance Studies Center shows that surveillance is much more complex than is popularly imagined. For one thing, privacy is not the core problem. The challenge of surveillance is that it works by discriminating between different groups, and such discrimination is only indirectly touched by things like privacy and data protection uh, laws. The second issue is that the state is not the only or even the key player. The challenge here is that governments are dependent on the corporate sector and its platforms. In, in Canada, I just mentioned Google, uh, Apple, and uh, Spotify, in which the core practices are those which I believe we have to call surveillance capitalism. So let me, let me move a little bit and talk about going beyond privacy and the state in our thinking about these issues. The term privacy refers primarily to a, a liberal right for individual persons, while it has played an important part in curtailing some of the worst effects of surveillance in the 20th century. For, se for, several, de for several decades, it hasn't really cut it. Well, why not? Because surveillance affects primarily groups of people within which, of course, individuals may suffer harms. The groups in question refer, relate to class and gender and, and race, familiar categories, um, or places of origin or sexuality. Surveillance sorts people into social categories so that those categories can be treated differently. Thus, Muslims, or those thought to be Muslims, find negotiating airport security much more difficult than some others. Black men are much more likely than others to be stopped when predictive policing methods are used. And women on welfare face constant obstacles in trying to look after their children in a world of computerized social security. When it comes to COVID-19, the use of large databases, whether within government-based healthcare systems or private corporate platforms, raise many critical issues. These include both questions of uh, the, ex the extent of informed consent to which privacy and data protection laws uh, relate and more di directly discriminatory practices that have the effect of privileging certain groups over others in their access to health care or that might disadvantage groups um, thought to be carriers of COVID-19 as occurred in many countries when the virus first spread from Wuhan, China. There are, of course, of course, other issues such as uh, who else, as well as medical and healthcare bodies, have access to those data, especially if they originated in or were uh, analyzed by private corporations. And these are all examples of the kinds of injustices that relate to the uses and misuses of data. As fine scholars such as Ruha Benjamin or uh, Virginia Eubanks demonstrate practices such as inappropriate data, data rather than the conventional but misleading appeal to privacy alone, would it not be better to question surveillance injustices in the name of something more appropriate, such as data justice? This places our question in the troublingly familiar context of racism, of uh, colonialism, sexism, and so on, as well as the erosions of the institutions of democratic contestation. We've already seen that the pandemic is unevenly distributed through the population. In Canada, elderly people, indigenous groups, and those in poverty are worst affected. But today's focus on data gathering, data handling, and data use occurs in an era that seems to have put its faith naively 
in big data as a solution to many kinds of social, political, and economic problems. So we might ask, well, how did all this occur? Well, it relates to the common misapprehension that surveillance is primarily the realm of the state. Of course, state agencies and departments do conduct much surveillance, but they do so with the assistance of corporations, platforms such as the ones I mentioned, Apple and Google, uh, and many others, um, with which they often have public-private partnerships, so-called. And moreover, they frequently depend on the methods that are uh, used by the corporations and on the data and the data analytics also used by those corporations. So put another way, this has to do with the rise of what is called surveillance capitalism. The best exponent of the term surveillance capitalism is Harvard's Shoshana Zuboff. She rightly argues that a critical moment came with the bursting dot-com bubble in 2000. Silicon Valley was in shock and panic looking for ways of rescuing their corporations. And Google was the first to recognize that uh, the waste data as it was thought of until then, in their servers had potential. They yielded clues about consumer behavior, and those clues could be used to target advertising and thus to make more accurate predictions about consumers that benefited their corporate clients. This is knowledge about consumers' human experiences, but not primarily for those consumers. Rather, for predictive futures, uh, sorry, for, for predictive futures markets, uh, what I think of as the mode of prediction. Zuboff sees human agency downplayed by surveillance capitalism that in turn weakens democracy. And sure enough, the tech companies are known for their embrace of computational government, hence their interest in healthcare data and specifically in contact tracing. Uh, and Zuboff herself suggests that this will create new supply chains for Google and Co. This of, this, of course, also fosters and builds on technical fixes, software solutions by governments. When this occurs, the technological often takes precedence rather than the whole context informing decision making. With contact tracing, this varies according to country. Singapore began, for example, with public health issues and then created a modest system based on those needs called Track Together, which is now being used in Australia as well. Whereas Israel turned quickly to a command and control approach requiring the intelligence agency Shin Bet to do contact tracing and turning the pandemic into a national security issue. And once you head down the tech solutionism road, it's hard to switch off the machine when it's done its work. So you get function creep and mission creep setting in, while at the same time other tech solutions seem attractive, as I discussed earlier on. So I'm saying that neither privacy nor the state are the best windows through which to understand COVID-related surveillance. The one tends to pay little heed to the systemic ways in which surveillance works, affecting uh, peoples as members of groups and all too frequently exacerbating already existing discriminations. The other fails to acknowledge the deep dependence of contemporary states on technology corporations, including for data gathering and analysis. Surveillance capitalism, whose methods have spawned digital contact tracing, encourages checks, uh, tech solutionism along with function creep. But as I say, I, it seems to me that many citizens and, and specialists, in fact, don't understand the sorts of things that I've been trying to suggest. Canadians, like others around the world, have been spending a lot more time on social media during the pandemic. And vague concerns do rise about what happens to the data they generate there, especially where marketers, government, financial institutions, or political parties are concerned. This may prompt more careful regulation or legal instruments, but does it actually do so? Well, apparently not. One strains to hear clear guidance from such regulators, especially when active citizens, journalists, human rights groups, and others uh, are raising serious questions about COVID-19 surveillance, including contact tracing. Citizens deserve to be better informed, especially about the way that their life chances and choices are affected by today's surveillance, uh, and I think surveillance capitalism. Unfortunately, there's plenty of evidence that governments rush into new schemes before they're properly assessed. Remember how uh, many 
uh, attempts were made to find suitable contact tracing and in several countries different schemes were tried before the one that uh, was decided uh, that was, was going to be used was determined. They will also find ways of loosening legal regulations to permit tech solutions happened in Ontario where I live, uh, such as contact tracing. In his fine little volume on uh, the COVID-19 catastrophe, Richard Horton, editor of the medical journal The Lancet, discusses the conundrum that while better surveillance would help healthcare professionals during a pandemic, he says surveillance cannot be developed without great care. He notes that, quote, an accommodation between liberty and scrutiny is the most important question facing Western society today. <clears throat> That's coming from a medical doctor. My response to uh, Horton would be to say yes to better surveillance, but no to the liberty that, sorry, no to the notion that liberty alone is the key value to be safeguarded. So, can we talk about curbing the coronopticon? Back in May 2020, The Economist ran an article on the coronopticon warning about the risks of unconstrained surveillance in the time of pandemic. That neologism, Coronopt, Opticon, uh, links Jeremy Bentham's prison pa plan from 1793, the Panopticon, with responses to the coronavirus. Who knows if we'd have recalled Bentham if not for Michel Foucault's work on the Panopticon? Who knows if we'd have uh, recalled that Bentham, if not for Michael Foucault, uh, might have, sorry, I'm confusing myself. Now, medical doctor Richard Horton quotes Foucault's study of Bentham's plan to automate inmate discipline. But he doesn't note that Foucault began that section of the book with comments on 17th century plagues, responses to which he sees as prompting new disciplines as governments step in to control society through quarantine and the like. The right of the sword, according to Foucault, was, that is the, the state, was being wielded against the right of death, that is the plague. The connection with government discipline and pandemics is an old one, but it also has to be updated. First, uh, philosopher uh, Giorgio Agamben observes that excessive government intervention is often enabled by a state of exception. That in the case of digital surveillance could be seen to occur in a major way in 9-11 and today even more extensively in the current pandemic. But second, it's also vital to consider not only how current conditions enable potentially excessive uh, and unaccountable surveillance, but also who is affected most profoundly by this. As Ashil Mbembe argues, race is also central to the power of surveillance, especially in the power of death over, uh, quote, foreign peoples. This reminds us that a critical area for surveillance is to consider the inequitable impact, not only of COVID-19, but also of the proffered surveillance involved. So, if the emerging coronopticon is to be curbed, attention must be paid to the views of ordinary citizens like us, and governments should check that items such as contact tracing apps are really doing the job they are supposed to do and take responsibility for them. There are opportunities here for some breaks with past errors, uh, permitting overbearing, excessive and unaccountable surveillance as followed 9-11, and for citizens to speak up, not just for their own personal privacy, but also for the real needs of the community, differentiated by class, race, gender, and so on, to be appropriately met by those whose particular task is to serve their interests. Opportunities also exist for the tech sector to step up, proposing not only new ways of combating the crisis, but ways that put public health issues, the human issues, front and center before seeking the most elegant algorithm or further use for profit-oriented uh, apps. All this requires imaginative, courageous, and cooperative ventures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. And I'd like to thank both uh, speakers for having exercised uh, admirable self-restraint in their use of uh, uh, the time I realized as we began that uh, as chair sitting in Montreal, I had no real way of uh, uh, controlling the time that was being taken by speakers sitting in uh, uh, various places of the continent and indeed the world. So thank you for having self-surveyed uh, uh, your, yourselves and uh, uh, stayed to within the time that was allotted.
Um, our third speaker is Professor Kaho, Kaho Mok, uh, who is uh, the Vice President uh, and uh, Dean of Graduate Studies, uh, and also the Lam Man Tan Chair of uh, Professor of Comparative Policy at Lingnan University, uh, Hong Kong. Professor Mok uh, is, uh, has worked creatively across the academic worlds of sociology, political science, and public and social policy, while building uh, his wide knowledge of China and the region. Uh, Professor Mok completed his undergraduate studies in public and social administration at the City University of Hong Kong uh, in 1989 and received an MPhil and a PhD in sociology from the Chinese University in Hong Kong in 1991 and the London School of Economics and Polit Political Science in 1994. Uh, he has published extensively in the fields of comparative education policy, comparative development and policy studies, and social development in contemporary China and East Asia. Uh, he's contributed to the field of social change and education policy in a variety of ways, not the least of which has been his leadership and entrepreneurial approach to the organization of the field. His recent published works have focused on comparative social development and social policy responses in the greater China region and East Asia. He is the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Asian Public Policy, and Asian Education and Development Studies, as well as a book series editor for Routledge and for Springer. I am giving you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I would like to share my screen. Can you hear me? Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, the organizer, for giving me this great opportunity to share with you my thought and also our research team's recent research regarding about how citizens in Greater Bay Area uh, evaluate about the city perform city's performance in combating the global health crisis that you and I are confronting today. So I think uh, we have been talking about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, and this is really unprecedented uh, for every one of us in this very difficult time. But the good news today for Hong Kong, after three weeks of you know, ups and downs in terms of local infection, uh, Hong Kong today has zero infection locally. It's a very good deal for us. And of course, we must be uh, sensitive and don't be too relaxed because by the end of June, uh, we many, many of us you know, in Hong Kong became so relaxed and we faced a very difficult time. And I thank uh, the two colleagues for setting out a nice you know, uh, context for the discussion. But my paper today is more uh, referring to citizens' evaluation in the Bay Area. For colleagues to know about the Bay Area, Greater Bay Area actually is the Guangdong area in southern part of China, comprising nine cities in the Bay Area, Guangdong, and also two special administrative regions, Macau and Hong Kong. And earlier on, the government in China has tried to re-engineering the economy, particularly the regional economy, by setting out uh, the blueprints of Greater Bay Area Development Blueprint. And uh, by positioning the Greater Bay Area as a new engine for economic and social development, uh, the Chinese government strongly encouraged people across the nine cities in Guangdong and two special administrative regions in Macau and Hong Kong to work together and trying to position the Bay Area as another Bay economy which has found to be very successful elsewhere, uh, like uh, in the States and in, New, uh, in Tokyo. And the Chinese government tries to make sure uh, there's another force and drive for uh, re-engineering about the economy in China. After knowing the reality, Chinese cannot rely heavily on the world factory, even though this is very successful for the time being, but you know, this is not sustainable. So in what way we can engage in a regional uh, development uh, perspective in order to create the collaboration across cities. And this is against this broader you know, developmental blueprints that uh, this uh, piece of study set out. Uh, before the pandemic, um, everyone talked about the Bay Area development, but now after the pandemic uh, coming in, 
So uh, what's happened, particularly about uh, how citizens evaluate uh, the city government's capacity in uh, combating the COVID becomes the core question uh, for this piece of study. Uh, this study uh, was uh, funded by uh, a joint center that Lingnan University and South China University of Technology co-founded a center last year uh, with a focus on Greater Bay Area social policy and governance. The core of this center's research is to examine about how people living in this particular area evaluate different sort of development issues and also what sort of you know policy implications could be drawn for better governance. Talking about uh, this piece of work, we want to contextualize uh, our study about cities and the broader issue related to governance. So one of the key themes about cities and governance, especially when uh, the Bay Area has experienced very rapid urbanization and the different form of urbanism has happened in the Bay Area, certainly would cause a different form of problem confronting uh, the government, local government in the Bay Area. And one issue really prominently uh, coming out from uh, cities development, rapid urbanization and governance is about social cohesion that government in China uh, has been taking it very uh, carefully. So uh, internationally, there are different uh, debates, but I just list out uh, some colleagues uh, talk about the indicator for social cohesion in Asia. And my colleagues are uh, working together to develop a kind of, you know, a, a, a social cohesion radar in Asia. But comparing uh, the understanding about uh, social cohesion uh, in Asia with that of China, we certainly see a major difference between the dimension of social cohesion in Asia as compared to social harmony as interpreted by some of the leaders in China, particularly uh, when Wen Jiabao and Wu Jintao were uh, in power and during the Wu Wan administration, they call for the development and promotion of social harmony, uh, particularly after urbanization has taken place in China, there's uh, happening a lot of uh, issues. So they call for social harmony in China and calling for the scientific outlook of development by looking into the, this different aspect in creating a more, uh, more you know, social harmony uh, in the Chinese society. So this has always been the kind of you know, uh, dream of the, uh, by the Chinese government to, stay, uh, to maintain stability and orderliness and trying to uh, promote more you know, uh, stability locally. So with the differences, understanding, uh, we set out to examine how uh, cities uh, respond to the promotion of social harmony, especially when dealing with the crisis management that the COVID-19 uh, has affected so many people in the region. Uh, this, our research team set out from this particular angle to examine uh, about how citizens uh, in Greater Bay Area assess the local government's performance in managing the crisis. So in April, early April this year, uh, we work with an online platform to send out questionnaire surveys to the live cities uh, in the Bay Area. The sample is proportionate to the populations across these nine cities among those residents age 18 and above. So live cities, I won't go into the detail, basically they are in the south, uh, part, uh, southern part of uh, China, Guangdong area. And we find our core question uh, except, uh, to be examined uh, in this piece of research is about uh, basically the impact of the COVID pandemic on cities. More specifically, we are interested in how city government manage uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as perceived by citizens. Citizens' perception and evaluation would be very important because it certainly uh, has impact on city governance and also the social cohesion or social harmony that I just uh, outlined about. And we also invited a city, uh, this city, a, a citizen from this nice city to compare what they heard and understand from their local cities or the city nearby them to do the kind of city comparison in terms of perception. 
and the intercity uh, perceptions would uh, hinge upon about the intercity cooperation that the development blueprint set out by the Chinese government to promoting more collaboration across the line cities and two SAR. So the survey consists of four parts. The first part is about the Bay Area residents' feeling and condition about the COVID light. The second is about the evaluation about the city government's ability in managing or combating the COVID-19 across the three regions, the Bay Area, within Guangdong area, Hong Kong, and Macau. And we'd also take this opportunity to invite the uh, residents, uh, the respondent, to comment on how they think about Hong Kong and Macau in terms of the overall uh, com uh, impression, because this has always been the case that competition across the city, particularly uh, in the last uh, year or so, the relationship across the border between Hong Kong and uh, the Bay Area or broadly defined uh, mainland China seems to be a lot very uh, satisfactory. So we would like to know about the uh, mainlanders, particularly for in, in this area, to comment on the impression of Hong Kong and Macau. And the last section, we also invite a respondent to uh, comment on the Chinese government sending out international support team or aid uh, to other countries in helping uh, these countries when facing the problems in terms of uh, international aid and support. And uh, we want to know about how they respond to that, especially when they are also experiencing about the problem in April and what's then their evaluation on government's move to this international presence of international aid. So the first part is about the mainland residents in the Bay Area, their assessment about uh, the situation, how far uh, they think that the COVID-19 has affected them uh, very uh, significantly. So they all, over 80% of the respondents believe the COVID-19 pandemic very serious or extremely serious, particularly when we are talking about in April time. And they also affected their daily life is in a high percentage, about 70 something percent, uh, feeling there's a certain impact on their daily life. And how about the evaluation about the city's management in terms of crisis management? We found that uh, 10 marks is the uh, most uh, satisfying, zero very unsatisfying. We found uh, quite a number of uh, the majority uh, consider the local government has dealt with particularly the performance of medical staff in helping the situation. They are very satisfied uh, with their performance, very high score in the medical professional. Uh, life on four. And comparing different cities' performance of the government as perceived by these uh, mainlanders in the Bay Area, we found that this is a, a, a kind of you know, report variation across uh, different cities. But overall, uh, they are over eight uh, out of 10 is quite high. And interestingly, when they compare the local city with the their perception about Hong Kong and Macau, they just perceive about the performance of the local government's management of the crisis. They see the local city, uh, not bad. The average is 8.61. Macau is good enough, but Hong Kong is worse, especially during the early phase of the uh, prevention measures taken by the government through the media that we watch. Hong Kong seems to be very disorganized at the very beginning when the COVID-19 came to this city. And we also ask them about, you know, city choice. If they want to go away for uh, preventing themselves for COVID-19, interestingly, the first choice, they want to remain in their own region. And more the, if they get the second choice, they will go to other cities uh, in China, not in Macau and not in Hong Kong. And when people think that, you know, Hong Kong's uh, health uh, prevention is so good, health system is so good, but this is not the case from the eyes of the uh, GBA citizens. We also asked another question about where, if they were given a choice for quarantine or medical treatment, where would they prefer to go? The same, you know, response being found from this particular question. If you are talking about the first choice, they want to remain their city in the Bay Area. If they are given other choice, and they may go to other cities in China instead of Hong Kong and Macau. As I mentioned, we take this opportunity to ask about the mainland residents to um, 
evaluate about the impression on Hong Kong and Macau. It's interesting that Hong Kong uh, is still seen as very good in terms of international city, shopping paradise, economically developed and open city. But Hong Kong, according to our uh, respondent, Hong Kong is no longer friendly to them. Hong Kong is seen to be less inclusive and even Hong Kong is very proud of the urban governance, but in the eyes of the respondent in this particular moment that we ask them, they don't see Hong Kong uh, is seen as a city with very good urban governance and less, you know, safe, especially I think after uh, a few months of, you know, social unrest and social movement in Hong Kong the last year, it certainly affects the way that uh, those uh, citizens in the Bay Area they have a new evaluation and perspective about Hong Kong. And I want to highlight the point here for those uh, uh, respondents, 80, 90%, this is not only watching Hong Kong on TV, they have actual experience coming, coming to Hong Kong before. So they experience the place. And uh, with this experience, they comment on the city uh, in person. Talking about Macau, well, uh, comparing to Hong Kong, in uh, different domains, I think uh, people have a higher, you know, uh, rating for Macau in terms of the overall impression, uh, especially comparing to Hong Kong, according to this uh, particular survey, we see uh, people in Bay Area thinking uh, Macau be more inclusive, safe, better go urban governance, and even better shopping paradise. So uh, with these uh, data, I think Hong Kong government and Hong Kong uh, should work very hard uh, to restore the confidence and faith from uh, the G, uh, G, uh, big, big area people if they want to attract them to Hong Kong. We also asked them about uh, during the very difficult time in China in April in the Bay Area, how they feel about the government in China sending out international aid team all across the world for supporting people and also countries they have facing the uh, problem. And not surprising, uh, they think that, you know, which country do you think has given China a great support in terms of preventing from COVID-19? These are Russia, Japan, and also Korea. And talking about going outside, what do you think about the Jap a Chinese government going uh, international, offering international help? We see that, you know, it's a high, uh, whole portion of respondents offering their support as a high approval rate, even though they are facing the crisis. And we also say, uh, ask the people in Bay area, do they buy about their government, the local government in the Bay area to reach out to support Hong Kong? Again, they also hold a very positive attitude towards their local government if needed and send out their help uh, teams to Hong Kong to help Hong Kong during the crisis. So putting all these you know, uh, findings together, I would like to think, uh, think about the issue when people think about where to go, uh, where to live, where to work and where to study about uh, the city. It's about not only material well-being, it's about the subjective well-being. And this piece of uh, research has indicated that the GBA uh, citizens has found their local governments uh, perform relatively well enough in managing the crisis. And when we contextualize about this piece of study, about uh, uh, people commenting on Hong Kong, Macau, and the mainland cities in the Bay Area, to Hong Kong, I think we have to catch up uh, more in order to convince people to come to Hong Kong, especially look into uh, the quality of life and subjective well-being. And uh, this is very important. Not only about employment status, and also the health status of Hong Kong. And, and those respondents, they think uh, the management in terms of health, in terms of the city uh, crisis management is better than that. Uh, uh, Hong Kong is not uh, less you know, favorable than that of the mainland city. So Hong Kong should uh, look into this particular area about the health status as a very important measures of subjective well-being. And the social connections, again, being revealed, um, especially when the Bay Area citizens, according to our study finding, they are, don't think Hong Kong is safe and friendly. And social connection, social contact is one of the most important driver of subjective well-being. I think it has a, a significant 
uh, impact on Hong Kong uh, in the post-COVID you know, era, how to make sure we can build a, a friendly city, uh, not only for the Bay Area, but internationally to attract friends to come to Hong Kong. And civic engagement and governance is another very in, important you know, aspect driving for uh, social cohesion or social harmony. So I think uh, Hong Kong has done quite well, but you know, looking into the, uh, this study, we have to look into in what way we can engage a better governance in order to make sure people uh, think that uh, Hong Kong is safe and secure when coming over to Hong Kong. Personal security is one of the area that we have to think about. Um, so I want to conclude the TPA mainland residents overall evaluation about the COVID-19 prevention in Hong Kong is not all negative, but they think that Hong Kong, according to the evaluation, is a bit inferior when comparing to Macau and the mainland city in the Bay Area. Second, what actually needed to look uh, in this piece of research is the GBA mainland residents overall impression of Hong Kong has, uh, in a way, distinct, uh, uh, has a, a negative impact. Though Hong Kong still be regarded as a very good in terms of economic development, internationalization, shopping, and openness. However, they found that Hong Kong, uh, in terms of urban governance, safety, inclusiveness, and friendliness, are uh, less you know, uh, welcome, and they want this area to be improved. And Hong Kong was an international uh, metropolitan where tourism was one of the most important pillars. I'm afraid that you know, during the COVID-19 and also the uh, social movement uh, that we experienced uh, in the last couple of months and project an image for the, for the Bay Area uh, that Hong Kong is socially not well uh, managed. That, that sort of you know, unfriendliness would have a direct impact on people's willingness to come to Hong Kong. And uh, if we do not perform well in terms of the regaining about the, the friendship uh, from the uh, neighborhood and also all around the world. And after this COVID-19, I think uh, a re very important uh, policy drawn from the study is about how Hong Kong government uh, should uh, make reference to work with other uh, cities to develop uh, a common set of consensus in terms of supporting each other in co collaboration about anti-COVID uh, uh, pandemic, especially in the aspect about preventive communication with the residents, how to work together. And we are living in uh, mega city development, no matter you, uh, we like it a lot, I think uh, we are part of the regional development blueprint. Although some of the Hong Kong people are very uh, nervous and also anxious about a course of border development. But internationally, when we are talking about cities and urban city, I think it's quite common to see the development of future city is to do with the neighborhood and also the hinterland. So I think Hong Kong has to work on with the uh, different governments in the region about our course jurisdictional governance. And this is really missing. And, and, and now particularly talking about Hong Kong's uh, infection case has a lot been improved when compared to Macau and also uh, the Bay Area. And how Hong Kong uh, government worked with the mainland government and Macau government together to make sure there's some kind of policy in place to ensure uh, the, our city government nearby can trust Hong Kong to allow mobility again. And uh, not only for tourism, but Hong Kong needs to go beyond our own city uh, for being locked down for, for a while and go out uh, for working with people elsewhere. And I just want to uh, conclude that you, you know, cities yeah. development relates to the uh, SDG and in what way uh, the global cities uh, development would uh, focus on this sustainable goal of development will become a major agenda issue for Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Mock. Uh, so I'm not going to introduce myself uh, since I've already been introduced. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both uh, uh, the organizers, Professor Ernie and uh, Professor Hjort. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, if I could be uh, allowed to uh, make a personal note. Professor Hjort and I uh, have known each other for decades uh, from our time uh, as graduate students at McGill. So it's a pleasure uh, to be able to see her 
uh, once again. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, like my North American colleagues, briefly acknowledge that I am in Montreal, uh, which is uh, the traditional territory of the Kanyenakaha uh, people, um, and uh, that Montreal has been uh, a traditional meeting ground of nations for <coughs> generations. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, that fact. Um, so I'm going to take, a, again, a slightly different uh, tack than that is, that's been taken by my colleagues. Uh, my main training uh, is as a political philosopher. And so uh, my main uh, sort of uh, reaction or, or, or instinct when uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic breaks out is to look at the ways in which uh, we react to it uh, in liberal democracies, especially uh, from a politically, how we organize ourselves politically to face uh, the crisis posed by uh, COVID-19. And I'd like to spend the few minutes that I have with, with you um, suggesting that we face something of a dilemma uh, about how to uh, uh, achieve a kind of balance between the need on the one hand to react quickly uh, to uh, the developments of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, developments which are sometimes very unpredictable. I'm sitting in Montreal where two weeks ago, uh, our rate of infection was extremely low uh, and uh, uh, you know, there was a little bit of sort of relaxing of uh, the constraints that had been imposed on us for months. And two weeks later, uh, in ways that were predicted by some, not by others, we are facing a kind of an uptick in the rate of infection. I think something that is characterizing Canada as a whole. So we need to have both the ability to respond quickly, uh, but we also need to have some amount of democratic control on the directions that are taken uh, by uh, governance. Uh, and both of these sort of uh, uh, desiderata, well, first of all, are in conflict, but they also pose uh, challenges, uh, which uh, I'd like to lay out for you briefly. So um, I'd like to sort of first point out two ways in which uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis has been uh, handled. Um, I'll call the first one, and I'm sorry, I don't have slides, uh, my uh, sort of uh, working assumption uh, during this crisis has been that the more technology I try to lay on uh, when I give presentations on Zoom, the more I leave myself a hostage to fortune. So you're just going to have to listen to me uh, speak, if that's okay. Um, so I think the most famous um, a, a person who uh, uh, internationally in the context of the um, COVID-19 crisis has been uh, Anders Tegnell, uh, who is the chief epidemiologist of uh, Sweden. Uh, now, part of the reason why he's been famous is that he has led Sweden down a path which has been uh, somewhat different from the path that's been followed by uh, other uh, countries. Uh, although uh, we could spend the whole time talking about uh, what's been going on in Sweden, uh, I think the perception has been that the Swedish uh, approach has been a lot more um, sort of laissez-faire, has been a lot more lax. Civil liberties uh, have been uh, sort of maintained. Um, recommendations have been uh, issued to the population, uh, but the level of uh, governmental constraint has been relatively uh, has been relatively uh, less. Now, uh, I don't want to talk about the choices that Sweden has made. What I want to do is to talk about a particularity of the constitutional structure of Sweden, which has not been discussed uh, perhaps quite as much, which is that uh, as a matter of law, um, the uh, uh, public services, like the public health authority that is set up uh, by uh, Swedish law, are exempted by law from what is referred to as ministerial control. In other words, uh, uh, Dr. Tegnell, uh, in uh, taking Sweden down the path that he has been taking it down, has, been, has enjoyed uh, complete immunity from all uh, political uh, pressures. Uh, this is quite a unique feature of the uh, Swedish context. Another feature which I should mention uh, is that uh, Sweden is one of the only liberal democracies uh, that I'm aware of uh, that doesn't have an emergency powers uh, clause um, outside of situations of war. So uh, unlike other uh, liberal democracies, uh, there is no possibility on the part of the Swedish uh, government to invoke something like a public health emergency in order to suspend civil liberties, which may go some way towards explaining uh, the direction that Sweden has uh, taken in issuing recommendations rather than binding uh, legislation. But the point that I wanted to make um, about Sweden is that it is sort of lies in an extreme 
um, in uh, sort of assuming that both in uh, normal circumstances and also in circumstances of emergency or crisis, such as the one that we find ourselves in, issues of public health are seen as being non-political. Um, and in virtue of being non-political, uh, I guess the Swedish constitution sees it as okay to immunize um, the chief epidemiologist and the chief public health uh, authority from um, a political uh, direction that might come from the minister. So uh, no ministerial rule in uh, Sweden. Um, Another uh, sort of, I think, uh, isomorphic kind of reaction, which has been taken this time in a vast uh, sort of much greater number of uh, jurisdictions, including uh, the province of Canada that I find myself in right now, Quebec, uh, has been to invoke uh, special measures, uh, public health emergency measures, which essentially uh, take uh, power away from uh, the legislature, which is the normal sovereign uh, in uh, sort of non-emergency times in a liberal democ democracy, and to give uh, a lot of power to the executive. Um, now, the justification of this is uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, the executive uh, is, uh, has the capacity to act quickly, uh, to follow and to react to changes in the path of the epidemic uh, on a dime uh, without needing to consult uh, in lengthy processes of legislative uh, debate. And this is what the situation calls for. We need uh, an executive that is able uh, to um, to act uh, quickly. Now, if you look at liberal democracies across the world and you look at the countries that have enacted public health emergency measures, um, there's a variation in uh, the degree to which the executive has essentially um, accepted uh, the directives given by public health authorities, chief epidemiologists like Dr. Tegnell in Sweden in deciding how to use this executive uh, power. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the chief epidemiologist has essentially, through the executive, been dictating policy uh, in the same way as has been the case in Sweden. Um, in other jurisdictions, there's perhaps a little bit more of a tug of war between uh, public health uh, directives and uh, the executive. But the point that I want to make is that uh, there has been a uh, wide range of cases in which decisions that have been made about how to deal with the coronavirus have been taken out of the political arena, have been taken out of the democratic arena of uh, debate and uh, contestation and placed uh, in uh, either the sort of technocratic arena of decision by uh, the uh, public health authorities or the area of executive uh, control. And this has met with very little resistance. If you look at uh, public opinions, uh, public opinion polls, both here in Quebec and uh, elsewhere, uh, the idea that we're facing a uh, sort of special kind of set of circumstances that requires the democracy, the normal role of legislature be uh, suspended has not met with um, a lot of opposition uh, from the population uh, as, uh, as a whole. Now, this first direction, uh, which is essentially to sort of de-democratize uh, decisions about uh, the, um, the, the, the path to take relative to the uh, pandemic, is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, uh, somebody who thinks that, uh, you know, uh, it's important that decisions in general be taken democratically will worry about uh, the general tone that uh, the uh, decision to move decisions about the COVID-19 pandemic out of the democratic arena involves. But I think that even if we look at the nature of the decisions that have to be taken in the context of a pandemic, um, there are problems that I think need to be uh, pointed out. One of the assumptions that uh, justifies moving decision making out of the democratic arena in a situation of pandemic is that there's really no controversy about the goals uh, that should be pursued uh, by public health officials uh, and by uh, democratically elected uh, officials in combating the pandemic. Uh, democracy is the realm of controversy. It's the realm where reasonable people can disagree about the goals of policy and uh, vie for uh, votes on the basis of their different conceptions of what the right policy is. And this is a case where there's no real controversy. Obviously, we need to uh, limit uh, infection uh, rates as much as possible. And this is the only goal that is uh, imaginable. I think that that is uh, actually something that is open to uh, uh, some degree of uh, debate. And let me point to at least two or three reasons why uh, this is open to debate. First of all, 
that statement that I just presented, that the goal of policy should be to limit infection to the greatest degree possible, is open to a number of uh, interpretations. Um, it can be read as meaning um, attenuation. Here in Quebec, the image that we have been sort of uh, used to is that of not exceeding the carrying capacity of the healthcare system. So the idea is not that we should try to um, extinguish the virus completely. There is a kind of a tacit understanding that that's impossible uh, or impossible in the absence of extreme uh, measures. A public health official uh, in the United States uh, said at some point during the crisis that uh, if he could just get all Americans to literally stop moving for two weeks, the virus would die on American territory for lack of anywhere to go. Obviously, that is an impossible thing to do. People will come into contact with one another. And so the question isn't, what should we do to extinguish the virus? The question is, how much of the virus can we tolerate, as it were? Um, and the image that we have uh, been uh, used to again in Quebec, and I think Quebec is not uh, exceptional amongst uh, uh, jurisdictions, is that uh, there is a, 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 a plateau beyond which uh, were we to get more infections, the carrying capacity of the healthcare system would be exceeded. But short of that line, um, without ever saying that there's a rate of infection that is acceptable, that is sort of tacitly what is being uh, proposed. That as long as we can get people treated, um, we should uh, uh, open uh, economic institutions and cultural institutions uh, to the point where if we were to go any further, we would exceed the carrying capacity of uh, the healthcare system. So that's one approach, which is in a way limiting the rate of infection, but limiting it with respect to uh, sort of uh, an imagined line of uh, the capacity of the healthcare system uh, to, uh, to, to deal with it versus other jurisdictions which have really considered the idea of limitation as being one of coming as close to, as possible to extinguishing the virus completely on the territory, which is perhaps an approach that has characterized uh, jurisdictions like um, New Zealand and Australia uh, to, to some degree. So which of the two should we choose? Well, that's a controversial question that reasonable people can disagree about. And where there is reasonable disagreement, I think that democracy has a, has a role. But beyond that, and the, 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 there's a second, uh, this is a second way in which I think it's, it's wrong to say that there is no controversy relative to the goals that should be pursued by public policy. Other health goals cannot be completely marginalized while we find ourselves in uh, the crisis that we are uh, in. Uh, again, I'm basing myself on the situation in Quebec, but I'm quite certain that it is uh, characteristic of uh, most societies that have focused uh, so intently on the coronavirus. A lot of other healthcare objectives have been sidelined. Uh, vital operations uh, have been, um, have been uh, deferred, sometimes with deleterious impacts on uh, patients. Um, mental health uh, uh, consequences that are, uh, as everybody sort of knows, uh, going to be accompanying this long-term uh, sort of set of constraints that we find ourselves in are ones that we're gonna have to deal with. But uh, certainly it's the case in Canada, and I think it's the case in a lot of other countries, that paying attention to these mental health costs is something that is now being deferred into an indefinite future. We know that this is a bill that we're going to have to pay, but when we have to pay it is an open question. I could go on, uh, but the point is uh, that uh, it is a debatable, controversial, and therefore democratically available question how we should balance uh, the different health goals that we should be pursuing even in the context of a uh, pandemic. And the third thing, widening our focus even more, is that health goals have to coexist with other goals of society uh, as, as well. Uh, again, I'm sure that Quebec is not exceptional about this. We've had a, a sort of big debate uh, about uh, whether and when to reopen schools. Uh, this is a debate that's been going on all over the world. Uh, now, there's obviously a health dimension to having kids go back to school, a mental health dimension, but there are other dimensions uh, relative to the debate over how and when to open schools that are irreducible to health considerations. We tacitly, again, um, acknowledge that it's probably a good thing to send kids back to school, even if in doing so, we tolerate and invite a slightly higher rate of uh, infection. 
So all of these questions are controversial and I could go on, but my time is uh, moving quickly, so I won't. Um, I think that the sort of public health uh, sort of technocratic approach that says it's okay to, um, uh, to uh, defer to public health officials, to chief epidemiologists, because after all, there is no controversy about the goals that we should be pursuing. There is a clear goal. And once we have that clear goal, the tools that are required to define the measures that we should be taking are ones that properly adhere in a uh, scientific approach like that of uh, epidemiology, I think is problematic. Now, uh, you would think from hearing me that the normal conclusion uh, of, uh, of this is that we should go back to uh, business as usual. And even if we are in the course of, a, in the context of a pandemic, a liberal democracy uh, should not sort of uh, uh, divert from uh, the path of making decisions in a, a, a democratic way. Now here I wanna say two things, uh, one of which is, uh, uh, that goes in two slightly different directions. The first point, and this is a point which I think in a way it's too late for us to take on board because we are in the midst of a pandemic, is that um, democracy I think works better uh, in, uh, in, in contexts in which uh, time could be taken in order to uh, sort of debate uh, the policy uh, tools that we will adopt in order to face a situation like uh, COVID-19. And we just don't have the time now. We have to react quickly. Now, uh, I've been spending a lot of time in the last few weeks reading documents that were prepared both by the Canadian government, by provincial government, and by international NGOs in the wake of recent uh, public health emergencies like SARS, like H1N1 and H5N1, uh, which present us with remarkable blueprints on the way to go forward uh, in meeting uh, the challenges posed by a pandemic. If you read, and I'm sure other countries have uh, similar documents, uh, the document that was, present, uh, that was prepared by Health Canada in the wake of the SARS crisis, Learning from SARS is the title of the document, uh, what you see is really a blueprint of proposals that could and should have been uh, engaged with uh, by normal functioning democratic institu institutions in the inter-pandemic period um, and which weren't. So as we come out of this crisis, and we will uh, at some point in the next few months or years, I think that one of the things uh, we have to uh, accept is that if we are going to allow democracy to function, we can't, once we are out of the pandemic crisis, forget that another pandemic uh, looms on the horizon, uh, sort of completely uh, uh, um, evacuate considerations of pandemic preparedness from the legislative agenda. Rather, democracy, democracy and democratic institutions should, um, in context of inter-pandemic relative calm, take these questions on. But here we are in a context of a pandemic crisis, so what do we do? You would think that from what I've said, an implication of my views is that we should allow democracy to function normally. Well, again, I think that that's probably, um, uh, that would be an, an excessive uh, reaction on the other side for a number of reasons, one of which has to do with time and, and, and emergency, but another one, uh, and this is something that I think uh, becomes quite evident when we look south of our border to the United States, has to do with some of the uh, perverse consequences of the politicization of, uh, the, um, of the crisis. I haven't done uh, this work, but I think it's work that should be done by people who have uh, greater empirical tools at their disposal uh, than I have. But I think it would be very interesting to look at the various ways in which uh, democracies have functioned relative to the crisis, depending on where they find themselves in the electoral cycle. Uh, in the electoral cycle. Um, there are many, many reasons why the situation in the United States is as dire as it is. Uh, it is probably overdetermined uh, uh, that uh, the reaction uh, of the United States uh, would be as, as relatively, compared to other liberal democracies, as problematic as it has been. But I wouldn't minimize the fact that uh, just in virtue of uh, bad luck, 
the brunt of the crisis has come in a period of electoral contestation. The brunt of the crisis came at a point in which uh, it is a sort of a natural tendency on the part of uh, both sides of the political crisis to gain political points, to try to gain political traction with respect to the electorate by um, pointing out the flaws in uh, the other's uh, position and by taking uh, policy positions, which are perhaps driven more by uh, relatively uninformed pop public opinion than, uh, by, uh, than by science. I want to leave time for, uh, so the dilemma that I pose uh, in, 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 in the paper that I'm working on that I thank the organizers for having allowed me to make some headway on is that um, both the sort of technocratic executive power approach and the democratic approach pose problems, pose challenges, which uh, uh, we need to uh, address and find a, a third way. What I have proposed here in Quebec uh, is that uh, in cases of emergency like the, uh, the pandemic, but also in others, a citizen's uh, commission be set up uh, by government, which includes both experts, representatives of political parties, but also ordinary citizens uh, be constituted in order to uh, uh, sort of take in information and consult with government as to the uh, appropriate uh, steps to take with respect to decisions that have to be made about the curtailment of uh, individual uh, rights, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of movement, uh, freedom to work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also with respect to uh, the way in which to rank and to um, uh, sort of discuss the various controversial points of policy uh, that need to continue to be discussed, and which I talked about at the beginning of uh, my presentation. Which health priorities? How should we consider and uh, interpret the need to limit um, the spread of infection? Should we uh, view it as limiting to the point of extinguishing if we can, or limiting it to the point of uh, the carrying capacity of our healthcare systems? So I think we need to have some kind of a separate body that is representative of citizens, but immunized from immediate political pressures in order not to fall into uh, what I think is uh, the other sort of uh, perverse consequence, that of depoliticizing uh, the decisions uh, to do with COVID uh, entirely. I'll stop there um, because we are uh, quickly running out of time. Take off my hat as a uh, um, uh, chair and put on my hat uh, as speaker and put on my hat as chair and perhaps uh, throw a couple of uh, questions uh, out to the uh, uh, speakers. A question that occurs to me in trying to sort of bring together the insights that we've heard from the first three speakers is in the view of, uh, and I, I would have something to say about this as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, all three of you. So I think Jamer's presentation uh, did a wonderful job in um, telling us about the particularities of this uh, particular crisis that we face in the world today in terms of its scale, right? There is, again, to say it in a, in a very quick sentence, um, something um, uh, very peculiar and unique about this um, global danger being posed by something that is infinitesimally small right, as opposed to say something like an earthquake or a hurricane. Something that we can't see is disrupting our personal, political, economic, cultural, you name it, lives. And so I wonder if, if the three of you might reflect just in a couple of sentences on the way in which this issue of scale, the fact that we are being threatened by something that we can't see, inflects the way in which we think about the political decisions that we make inflects the way in which perhaps ordinary citizens think about this danger relative to other dangers. Is there something about the uh, invisibility, the infinitesimal scale of uh, the uh, of the virus that gives rise um, to uh, a different kind of political perception, be it on the part of leaders or on the part of the population uh, as a whole? Um, so I don't know whether that question is, is clear, whether it might gain any traction uh, with our speakers. Jamer, maybe I'll, um, since you, you've been listening to us patiently for the last uh, hour, is, I don't know if you, if you, if you might want to kick us off on that question, if, if you find it uh, congenial. 
Yeah, of course. Um, and certainly goes to the heart of what I was <clears throat> talking about. And the, um, I guess, you know, for me, what I was trying to express as well is the idea that while this is invisible, um, we're faced with so many other invisibilities at this moment, so many other immaterialities, that it's the conflation or it's the compounding of those that makes this especially dangerous. So I think of Professor Lyons' uh, talk as well, the kind of uh, th our incapacity to kind of um, figure or, or image surveillance um, and the tracking that goes along with that is perhaps not an equal threat, uh, but another threat um, that comes along with us at the same time. And so um, its invisibility certainly makes it that much worse. It, it kind of adds to um, the level of paranoia, the level of uh, kind of mistrust and lack of uh, knowledge. But I think what makes this moment particularly terrifying globally, um, and because you don't see this, I mean, the United States might be, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the worst example um, of this, but you certainly see this in plenty of other countries, which is just the way in which the virus is sort of piggybacked onto um, information and its circulation uh, in equally contagious kinds of ways. Um, so that in many instances, it's as much a threat, the, the kind of um, trustworthiness or the uh, availability of trustworthy information is as much a threat to public health in some ways. I mean, it's, it's not coincidental that we have the highest rates of death uh, due to the coronavirus, uh, or, or highest numbers of deaths, I should say, our rates are, are more globally um, comparable, but um, in part because of a politicization of information and the politicization, as you describe, of public health, and that that's really, and, and we can't seem to find a way out of that. So to me, it's those kind of, um, those two things combined, but it's invisibility certainly plays a role, um, but it's invisibility has to be looked at because we've had other pandemics where it's, you know, and we have the flu season every year. I'm struck often by the extent to which, you know, I, in the beginning of the coronavirus, I had to really look up flu statistics just to have a comparable scale to know, well, what is 100,000 deaths? Is that terrible? Is that like the flu? You know, but in the United States, we have about 30 to 40,000 deaths annually from the seasonal flu. So that starts to give me a scale. I also looked at how many deaths from automobiles we have a much more kind of material cause of death, a much more physical cause of death, about 25 to 30,000. So trying to understand where these stack up, where these compare relatively. But what is um, so much different about this is that the information flows globally, just as the virus flows globally. And it's those two currents um, that seem to me that make this kind of a unique moment in battling something like this. We can't just hunker down physically because we haven't hunkered down sort of in terms of the information ecosystem. So one of the things that uh, Jaber mentioned at the beginning of his, his answer, uh, and here I'm going to direct a, a question to, uh, to David, is, is, is fear. There's something about the infinitesimally small uh, that perhaps leads to a kind of fear or panic uh, that isn't caused by uh, other threats, which numerically, quantitatively, may be just as, uh, uh, as great. The idea uh, that we are being threatened by something that we can't see. David, do you think that the, the, uh, the relative uh, acceptability of surveillance measures uh, to the general population is somehow due to the greater uh, fear or panic that something like uh, coronavirus uh, has given rise to? Or is our susceptibility to surveillance already something that was well established before uh, coronavirus came online? Yeah, it's a it's good question. Um... Let, let me let me start by just continuing the thread that uh, Jamer was on, and and then come back to that. And you can remind me if I forget what the question was. The um, it seems to me that the question of fear is something that was occurring to me too, thinking about the uh, invisibility of the virus, what what exactly it looks like, even if we've had it. Uh, produced for us in some some form, the sphere with the little nodules coming out of it. It, it actually doesn't help me very much to see to see what it might look like, um, and because it really is invisible. And I think that that's connected to two other things at least. One is that um, we we don't know where it is. We can't see it, and we're told where it is. Is it on door handles? Is it 
is, it, is it something that is really contained by a mask? Is it something that is uh, that, that should make you not go to your mailbox and, and take out your mail for three days, as some of my neighbors have done? Um, is it, you know, what, where is this thing? It's, 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 it's invisibility, I think, is a, is, is a prompt to fear. But then also, as we've seen over the course of the pandemic, so it, it seems to be morphing in its effects. So once upon a time, it was uh, folks like me who were counted as older members of the population who were at high risk. And now we're told that actually it's mainly affecting people under 40, but it's affecting people under 40 differently. And so, you know, we, we can't see it. Uh, we're not sure where it is. And we're not sure how its effects are, are spreading or not. So, yeah, I think there, there is a, a, lot of, a lot of fear there. Your question had to do with uh, surveillance responses. And really the, the burden of what I was trying to say was that despite the fact that we went through uh, a, a huge increase in multiple forms of surveillance after 9-11 that was very much characterized by these public-private partnerships and so on and so forth, although we went through that, um, we, we haven't yet grasped that it, it's not a kind of Orwellian situation. It's, it's something in which we're all engaged. We're all part of it. It's our everyday data uh, handling through our own uh, online interactions that generate the data that are used by the corporations and now are being used by those who are working uh, for public health and to uh, find other kinds of solutions. So, you know, I think that there, my concern is that we, we haven't really learned the lessons of 9-11 and especially we haven't really thought about the actual digital world that we are living in from the point of view of saying, okay, so what are the ways in which surveillance is affecting us today? And how does it, uh, how should that inform our responses? I mean, so much we hear this notion, especially in North America, that privacy has somehow got to be, uh, has got to be protected. Well, of course, I believe that there are important parts of our personal lives that uh, we consider private and we should indeed uh, have some protections, protections over them. But that isn't the key issue that is actually produced by the use of uh, particular kinds of algorithms and systems in contemporary surveillance. It is much more to do with something that divides the population into categories so that categories can be treated differently, which in itself, of course, is a relatively innocent and innocuous matter. But the problem is that the way that it is occurring, and especially with the increasing uh, dependence on corporate forms of data analysis, which are, of course, intended to demarket certain people and uh, to allow privilege to others, they are discriminatory. And we haven't examined how the institutions that are now using those data are actually being, as it were, infected by the origins of those data processing systems. So yeah, I think there are several kinds of uh, fear and uh, concern that we could point the finger to uh, in this circumstance. So, uh, uh, Professor Bach, I wonder whether any of the uh, sort of uh, quantitative research that you're aware of uh, points to any kind of specificity about uh, the reactions that people have, both about the dangers that they face and about the appropriateness of the reactions by governments uh, to, uh, to what is being done. Is there any specificity about the coronavirus relative to other uh, well-known dangers uh, that we face? Uh, uh, the, you know, that, that, that we know, is there something special about uh, something like a virus in people's perceptions? Well, I think based upon our research, it's not only about perception. I think perception built upon the experience that uh, they uh, confront with the crisis. But at the same time, they also see how a local government managed the crisis in the Bay Area. So we found that uh, uh, the Chinese government, because I think there's a socialist system, uh, they're very decisive and determined to combating uh, the COVID-19. So it's unlike uh, democratic countries that people still have debate about in what way they can handle that. I think this is a very different experience. So that's why the GBA citizen, when comparing the 
the experience about city government management with that of Hong Kong and Macau would have a different, you know, uh, perceptions and also evaluation. And it forms a higher level of trust, particularly in China, about the, uh, the people's trust in the central government. So they have a higher approval rate of the government to go out uh, to have the international aid helping those countries elsewhere. So I think it goes back to uh, my, uh, my call is commenting on the trust. I think uh, we are facing a, a huge issue this day about governance, about how people trust their government. And also you certainly affect the way how they govern. But to, to conclude, I think uh, this is important to remain uh, positive and try to pro proactive to do, to choose something uh, good enough to solve the problem and treating the abnormal uh, normal. This is my, my response, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are not gonna have time for uh, Q&A. It's 9.50. I uh, reached out to the organizers to see whether we could have a little bit of extra time, but I totally understand that with a, a conference of this scale, it's important that we stay uh, strictly to schedule. So I'd like to thank uh, my fellow panelists uh, for their fascinating talks. I think there are a lot of connections that we uh, could have made. Unfortunately, uh, I think that this uh, uh, pandemic is going to be with us for um, you know some time to come. And so the questions that we started uh, sort of raising in the context of our discussions, we will probably be continuing to think about and to discuss in uh, months and perhaps even years to come. So um, thank you very much to the organizers. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the people who uh, have been listening in. Uh, I, I learned a great deal from your presentations and uh, I hand it back to uh, the organizers of the conference, perhaps if you want to say the final word. Other than to thank everybody for the marvelous um, you know, discussion and, and papers, very, very thoughtful and insightful. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye.